My name is Andrew Thorson. Um, it's been a long day. Hope uh, I will not bore you down with all these metrics. But uh, it is an essential part of running your fling jobs in production. Um, before I go into all the details of what we did with metrics uh, in our Walmart Labs projects, let me briefly tell you a few trivia facts about Walmart and Walmart Labs and uh, which applications we are actually running. So um, 10,000 feet view, Walmart is the largest retailer in the world right now. Most of it is, of course, physical stores. So you probably all know about those stores where people go shop on uh, Black Fridays, uh, Cyber Mondays, and uh, Christmas, right? But Walmart also has a Walmart.com uh, e-commerce business. It's actually probably second largest at this point after Amazon in the US. And uh, Walmart Labs is a technology provider for Walmart.com. So basically, it started as a research division, but quickly grew into the entire software platform for running Walmart.com e-commerce business. Within the labs, we actually have a number of teams. Uh, you can imagine all the things that the large retail portal needs, like search, uh, supply chain management, uh, checkout, and things like this. Smart pricing is one of those teams. We actually do what we call algorithmic pricing for all the Walmart 1P, basically, primary catalog. Uh, these days, uh, algorithmic pricing has to be done in real time. So uh, the competition with uh, Amazon and other retailers is so intense that we need to track what the price of our competition is in real time and be able to respond. It kind of migrating towards something that looks like a financial exchange, where people, where ro robotic strategies actually trade each other, right? So Walmart is trading, Amazon is trading, and we compete on uh, at least core consumables portion. So our team is responsible for developing those algorithmic pricing strategies and providing all the price feeds into the actual portal. Um, we uh, do have two parts of the team. Actually, within the team, there's many groups that are responsible for different things. We are quite polyglot. We have data scientists that mostly use Python. Uh, we have data engineering team using Scala and Java. We actually have a sister team in, at the jet.com site, which is also part of Walmart right now. They mostly use C-sharp. Um, and uh, for the real time, we, uh, like about a year ago, we adopted Flink as a streaming platform, and we are quite happy with this. So I'm not going to tell you much about how we actually run Flink. I'm going to focus on monitoring and providing real-time business intelligence. Okay? So just a few quick facts about which applications we actually deploy in Flink. Um, so I mentioned that it's algorithmic. So uh, we do have different pricing strategies for different items. Um, and some of them are based on competition analysis, so we track the competition price. Some of them are based on economic modeling of uh, how, how our sales are going, what, what's the elasticity of the sales with respect to price. So if we change the price, how would it impact our sales, right? And, of course, we need to keep track of the inventory data and sales and uh, be able to calculate cost and profit, right? In terms of the ingestion, what kind of data we need to, to use to calculate this, it's pretty rich. So we have uh, Walmart.com different sources, right? How we can track inventory and things like this. We also have this big physical business, uh, Walmart stores, and we need to make sure that we play along with the physical stores, right? Um, so we ingest them as well. Uh, third, uh, we are actually on the merchant side of our business, so it means that there is uh, 1P and 3P, 3P catalogs, so there is a marketplace where merchants can uh, sell their items. And even for 1P, we have category managers that act as basically merchant representatives for some part of the inventory. So there is a vast amount of merchant data that needs to flow into our app, right, related to the item lifecycle. Uh, of course, there is competition data that may come from different sources and some third-party sources as well. So pretty rich ingestion, right? The, the main kind of scale of our, uh, of our size is our catalog, right? So uh, there is actually not one but two catalogs uh, called 1P and 3P. 1P means it's the items that Walmart actually sells by itself, and it's roughly 5 million items right now. And the rest of it is 3P, which is a marketplace where third-party vendors may sell it through Walmart, and it's 
almost 100 million items right now. Uh, so it's actually quite large. And uh, what makes it difficult also is that we need to be able to compute different business intelligence metrics at the item level or item categories baskets level. So we need to provide feedback to our merchants how well their part of the inventory is doing, right? So business intelligence is one of the critical functions here, right? Not only we need to price, but we need to keep track of how well we are doing with respect to current price. So it's multi-strategy, so we need to be able to support multiple pricing strategy and probably dynamically switch uh, um, on the item level which strategy we are using. Um, for example, the merchant might want to do a campaign to liquidate certain parts of the inventory, so we need to switch into the liquidation mode and see how, what's the sales velocity, is it selling nicely and can we terminate their inventory according to the deadline or not. So. Uh, in order to do multi-strategy, we actually need to provide business intelligence. That's the essential input for choosing the strategy. And I mentioned the real-time. Without real-time, we'll be just losing money to Amazon every day. So uh, as soon as any essential inputs are changed, and we need to ingest them in real-time in the first place, like uh, what is the current price of this item at Amazon? Can we, can we get it in real-time? But let's say we do. Can we reprice it within five minutes? And can we do it for any of those five million first party uh, items on our catalog? This is a challenge, and uh, that's what we use Flink for. Um, some of the things that our models use, we actually compute in quasi real time. There's basically some kind of a offline, online hybrid training for our, some of our statistical models where we basically train our forecasting and elasticity models uh, not in real time, but in quasi real time, but we do serve them in real time through Flink, right? And we need to be able to use a bunch of tricks to handle the throughput in our, in our pipelines, right? So uh, we need to filter out a bunch of triggers that would not mean a new price, for example. And you can use probabilistic filtering, for example. If this is a duplicate trigger, we probably should not reprice, right? And we, sometimes we need to micro batch uh, a price push so that we don't overwhelm our portal with repricing, right? So, I'm not sure you can see all the inputs here. Yeah. But basically, let me tell you about tech stack. So, Flink is the primary engine for our uh, real-time smart pricing. Uh, another essential technology is Kafka. So, uh, we tend to exchange data and uh, use the publish subscribe through Kafka. So our main uh, uh, sources and things in Flink are actually Kafka topics. But those are not the only ones. Um, we use Cassandra and Redis for, uh, as a NoSQL database and distributed cache. We recently introduced Google RPC for um, duplex streaming microservices that we can invoke from within Flink. That basically allowed us to write those models in Python and serve them via gRPC in Flink. That's something new, and I think this is very similar to the Apache Beam uh, Python connector model. Um, we also rely on Hive for doing offline uh, machine learning feature engineering. Um, so the data from Flink gets persisted in uh, HDFS, and then we can query it using Hive. Um, for business intelligence, there's a data warehouse that we maintain in Druid. Uh, you can execute ad hoc queries against it and get near real-time reports, but the capabilities of this data warehouse are limited by Druid itself. So you can do filters and aggregates, but not as, as rich as what we want to do in real-time business intelligence. Um, finally, on the machine learning side, we mostly write them using PySpark and Scikit. And we do have a legacy uh, uh, batch processes in Azkaban, which we are migrating actively to Flink, because we only picked it up uh, a year ago, and not everything yet is on Flink. Okay, so that's our tech stack. So let me focus right now on monitoring and business intelligence. So uh, let's say we already have those pricing pipelines running in Flink, but we don't know really what's going on. Um, so. Uh, we need to be able to tell our merchants how well their items are selling, right? And in particular, our 1P category managers need to be able to, 
to see if something is mispriced or strategy needs to be changed, right? So we have a small kind of set of tools that supports our monitoring and BI, right? So first of all, essential stuff, uh, health check of our Flink pipelines. So it's a typical metrics framework. I'm going to cover most of it in the next slides. So uh, we uh, collect metrics from within Flink and other applications. We uh, use time series DB and provide them our uh, Jet.com team is using Prometheus, and we visualize them using Grafana and Eurag. Um, the uh, business reporting that we produce a massive number of reports every day, and those are mostly served using Hive, and uh, some of the, uh, of the users use Tableau to visualize the results. Um, auditing means that all the data that flows through our flank gets persisted in HDFS, and then we can query it. Uh, using Hive or, or Presto. And finally, for business intelligence, the current technology is Druid. But I'm going to tell you about going beyond Druid in this talk. So Druid is nice. If you never use that, um, you can ingest data in real time into Druid and query it in real time really, really fast using basic uh, APIs in Druid. Uh, it's a very powerful data warehouse. You can get reports about last 15 minutes or last hour, what's happening today about pretty much everything at the item level or even more granular. Uh, but limitations are it's not exactly real time and you can only do basic operations there, mostly filters and simple aggregates, okay? Uh, we wanna do more and uh, here's the use cases that we are exploring right now. This is very active work uh, that we call the real-time business intelligence. This is the uh, I believe this is a trending area in uh, many Flink applications that I saw today at the conference. Uh, some of the speakers were talking in the context of uh, streaming SQL, uh, how you can perform ad hoc streaming SQL jobs uh, on top of your, of your streaming data. You can think about it. Let's say we want to be able to execute queries on all of the data that's flowing through our Flink and aggregate, okay? It's not necessarily SQL aggregates, but maybe more complex stuff. So that's what a real-time business intelligence is. And uh, to make it more concrete to you, what kind of things we want to do in real-time BI. So first of all, of course, uh, our category managers and our product managers, they want to do multi-dimensional KPI monitoring in real-time, right? So they define those metrics that are meaningful to us, like uh, what's our mid bid score compared to Amazon? And is there any stop loss on some, some category? Are we losing money on this or not? And uh, if, if we do, we would like to stop it right now and know about it right now and get alerts, right? So the difference compared to regular metrics is those are typically multidimensional. So uh, uh, the monitoring technology that is typically available is always warning you about dimensionality abuse. Don't introduce too many dimensions. You might overwhelm your technology. But this is an inherently multidimensional problem. Right? What if I want to track it at the item level, and we have those 5 million items or 100 million items in the streaming marketplace? Next thing is, uh, you always want to know what are the hot items, right? And the merchants may have different categories, how they can define hot items. So this is what we call the categorized top K counters. So you always want to know the tail according to some criteria, right? And see which, which of the items are trending right now. So, uh, this is also a real-time business intelligence problem. Uh, today I saw one talk where this was solved using machine learning in Flink. Uh, this is not exactly a tough problem. You just need to be able to do, to do quick top K queries, right? Anomaly detection. Um, we ingest so many inputs, some, well, always actually, some of those inputs are bad, all right? And we need to be able to detect them. Basically, we want to have some stateful outlier input detectors. Basically, those uh, stateful detectors should monitor our pipeline for a while and have a, a, a snapshot in state, what is normal behavior for this particular item or um, um, item category. And once it detects that something starts to deviate from normal, it should basically trigger an alert. So this can be as complex as one of the toughest machine learning problems, or it can be as simple as a rule-based. Uh, it's still the same, the same type of application, anomaly detection. Right. Uh, finally, price strategy selection. So uh, um, this is something that our Jet.com team started to explore recently. 
So uh, they want to be able to, to see different trends at the item level, and depending on which trend is dominating right now, they may want to switch different pricing strategies. And they may want to use different data sources to compute those trends. Uh, even social data, like users start talking about this particular item on chat.com, and trend is, is going upward, maybe we need to start upselling it, okay? So price strategy selection can be seen as a real-time business intelligence strategy. And maybe you want to ride this trend for just a few hours and switch back to a normal strategy, right? Um, so these are the use cases that we want to solve using real-time business intelligence. Uh, but how do we do that, okay? One thing that we know is that we already have the existing streaming uh, pricing pipelines in, in Flink. And Flink is a scalable, general-purpose streaming compute engine. So why not just enrich them to compute those real-time business intelligence metrics on the site? The data is already flowing through Flink. Uh, maybe let's just write on it and compute those metrics as a byproduct, right? So there's pros and cons. Um, so pros, it, there's many pros, actually. So uh, we can leverage existing Flink pipeline scalability. We can scale as our pipeline scaled, okay? There's data is already available in memory, so uh, we can just collocate the, uh, the logic that imputes the I metrics with the actual pricing data that is flowing. We can do incremental code decoration with metrics. I'm actually gonna show you how easy it is. And uh, we can leverage the entire spectrum of Flink APIs. That's pretty good. The cons, metric dimensionality abuse. So if we really deploy those multidimensional metrics, we may easily overwhelm the, met the, uh, the entire metrics collection system, right? And there might be performance side effects on Flink because computing the metrics may easily be more complex than running some real Flink operator. Uh, real quick tour of what's available right now out of the box in Flink called Flink metrics. So these are drop wizard-like metrics. So you have counters, gauges, histograms, and meters, right? Uh, each, met each metric has a key that is scoped. Uh, there's system part of the, uh, of the scope that is a task manager, subtask operator. Uh, that's what Flink um, provides. And users can define a custom suffix, which is available as a metric group feature. Then uh, Flink runtime context is available to every rich function operator. And using this Flink runtime context, you can register your own metric groups. Okay, this is pretty powerful. You can define your own metric groups and they will be registered together with Flink metrics. And then you can configure different Flink metric reporters. They basically micro-batch uh, the metrics push. So every so often they will push all the new values of the metrics into your into a time series DB. There's a number of built-in metrics that Flink provides out of the box and some of the reporters, in particular is the scheduled drop wizard reporter. And drop wizard has all kinds of connectors. So your favorite time series DB is usually supported through Drop Wizard and Flink wraps it, right? And finally, in Flink Web Monitor, you can actually see those metrics. It's really basic navigation and charting. It doesn't do any aggregations. Uh, it's simple, it's extensible, uh, it's good fit for health checking, but there's a number of questions that you need to solve for yourself if you're using it. So how to define the logic that computes the metrics? You have your own metrics, you want to Define this logic, where do you do that? How do you decorate uh, those Flink operators with those metrics if you use the data that flows through those operators? Uh, so I have my logic, I know the data is flowing through an operator, how do I attach it, this metric to the operator? This is the central problem, actually. Uh, how can we incrementally add more and more metrics as, as we go? Uh, how to handle dynamic business intelligence like metrics where dimension values need to be extracted from data. There is no static dimension set to join on. We actually want to extract it from data. And how do we do metrics aggregation? Do we do it in Flink, or do we do it outside of the Flink? Okay, so those questions I was facing uh, a few months ago. And finally, a real good question. Is Flink even the right tool? Okay, so remember we are using Kafka together with Flink. Kafka recently introduced KSQL, and there's a number of other streaming SQL. So maybe KSQL is the right tool for this. So who knows? But we decided to go with Flink, give it a try, and see how it works, okay? Um, 
So we decided to extend Flick metrics and make, basically make a little library that we can use on top of Flink metrics. So let me give you a quick overview of what this library does for us. So it just answers those questions that were in red on the previous slide. So how to define metric logic? We define a, a small hierarchy, what we call the Flink metric calculator, and we offer a, a nice little library of pre-built calculators. So some of the basic things, like uh, histograms and counters, we provide the logic for. But this hierarchy allows you to extend it further, and you can attach your own logic with functional programming lambdas that are available in, in Java and Scala. So you can just supply the lambdas that compute the logic as a parameter in construction of the Flink metric calculator. How to attach to existing Flink operators? That's a tough problem. So you already have a pipeline. You want to decorate it with metrics. So basically, somebody else already defined those operators, and now you want to override those operators and make them compute metrics as well, right? So that's what decorator does. Uh, so we define another hierarchy of what we call the Flink meter operator provider. So it basically takes an existing operator and turns it into something else that also computes metrics. Um, and uh, in order to make this annotation based, we had to overload calls to this streaming execution environment add operator logic. So it kind of intercepts the old logic and provides a new operator to Flink, okay? Um, can we make this metric development rapid, allow it to easily add new metrics? So I'll show you how to do this with programmatic ways, writing real code, or doing annotations of existing Flink pipelines. Um, finally, the uh, dynamic dimensions that are typically associated with business intelligence. So it's the same approach, but we use a thing called key extractor. This is, again, a lambda. And we need to keep track of the state per key and register metrics per key. So Flink is a stateful processor, so it's pretty easy to do that. So this is a real snippet of Java code defining those concepts. So uh, basically, we say that we now want to use metered functions in Flink, and they are extending reach function. So that's how we get the, uh, the, um, the Flink runtime context, and we can register metrics. Okay, And metric calculator is a simple thing. It actually can bootstrap itself, given the context. And it holds basically a map of metrics within, right? And this provider that allows us to decorate existing operators, it basically has the metrics within, it has the underlying delegate, and it, it is a supplier of another operator, okay? So I can call get on it and get a, a decorated operator, okay? That's what the library does for us. Um, and let me show you how we can really use. That's how we are actually using it. So you can define your own simple calculator bundles, OK? So this is a method that does a bundle of three simple calculators for us. We have an event counter, a rate meter, and a traffic histogram that we can attach to any operator. You see it's strongly typed. Uh, if, uh, if we call this method, we'll get the calculators, and our operator provider can decorate any operator with those metrics. Right? And there's two ways to, to attach it to existing operators. Programmatic way is, in your streaming pipeline code, uh, you actually replace the, uh, the data stream API call, like map, of existing operator with a decorated operator. So for example, you already have a stream and you're doing a map stage, and you had a JSON Marshall operator before. Now you say, let's uh, decorate it through a metered map provider and attach this basic metrics package to it. That's all that is required. So now our operator is different. It also computes metrics. And it's pretty easy to translate it into annotation. So you don't actually need to write the real code for it. So you use the metrics calculated annotation. You give a, you give a reference to a, a config that defines the, where the logic sits for computing the metrics. And it becomes annotated, and our override of the get transformation for the streaming execution environment will actually plug in a different operator. So on, at the code level, you, you won't even see it, but at the runtime level, it will actually plug in a different operator, okay? That will also compute the metrics. So this is a real basic use case. That's typically how you do health check type of metrics, right? 
I want to count the events flowing through this particular operator. I want to see the, uh, the meter and maybe do a histogram of the traffic. There is no business intelligence on it yet, okay? Um, so now let's talk about business intelligence. So um, there's two ways to do it in Flink, and you need to decide for yourself which way is better for you. I only provide some suggestions. So the first way I call this in process. Um, in process means that uh, we calculate a small dimension cube of metrics for a particular operator as part of the, of the operator itself, okay? From the um, code point of view, it's just a regular calculator that extends a class called vector metrics calculator in our library. So it's a calculator that holds a vector of potentially infinite lengths of metrics in, in our operator. Uh, when a data, a data event comes into this operator, it will try to extract a key of the metric from this data, and will try to compute, actually update the, the, the state of the metric as part of the operator itself, okay? So it's completely synchronous with this operator, all right? Um, no aggregation is done in Flink, um, so those metrics that are kept as a vector will be reported through the regular Flink reporter without any aggregation. And aggregation is completely external. So if you want to group by um, and um, do a sum, you have to do it outside of Flink, okay? So in terms of the streaming pipeline code, you don't even see anything related to metrics at all. But your operators compute a vector of business intelligence metrics and dynamically add new values to the vector. And there is always potential for abuse of dimensionality. Your vector size may grow so large that you will have problems. It may blow the task manager memory, and it may blow the operator state in Flink, and may actually create problems for Flink metrics reporter, even though that thing runs asynchronously, okay? So here's an example how you can define this type of metrics. Again, same code. It's just that we're extending the uh, vector counter calculator, and we provide an extra snippet, extra function that says, this is the function that allows you to extract the metric key from the data, okay? So you can dynamically infer new keys as the data comes in, all right? So this one in particular is doing a counter by price change description. This is a, a dynamic string that is an attribute of, of our event in Flink, and we extract it from the event and we may discover those different price change descriptions dynamically. The second way, which I think is more preferable for large scale cases, because it minimizes the chances of abuse of dimensionality, is a side output. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the side output feature that was introduced in 1.3. This is the picture for it. Basically, it's a, it's a, it's a nice feature that comes with a process function in Flink. Um, so process functions allows you to compute the main output and asynchronously compute a side output. So your operator emits two outputs. The main one is a side one. And side output has pretty much no effect on the main output. So there is no chance you can slow down your operator, okay? So the idea here is just use those vector metrics, but use the Flink process function operator provided with them. Um, so that particular provider will delegate all the actual metrics computation to the side output, and we now have an explicit side output stream within Flink. That allows us to do aggregation explicitly in Flink. So we can add a downstream stage, which is scheduled independently and typically involves a data shuffle, and pre-aggregate them in Flink or just sync them to a, to a business intelligence data warehouse. And we can, see, we, we can actually process massive amounts of business intelligence metrics this way. So this is, I think, a preferred part in how business intelligence metrics can be computed in Flink. Um, data engineers will have to explicitly handle uh, business intelligence metrics in Flink, so they need to worry about it, but I can tell you that this concern is always there. You cannot just compute massive amounts of business intelligence metrics and kind of hope that it, it just works. I believe that it's always best to explicitly handle it via Flink, okay? So, a final bit of advice. So my talk covered how you can define those metrics and make Flink compute them and push them. But what happens next is more important, okay? Typically, you have 
uh, time series DB, which is a, a metrics backend. And the first advice is you need to make a proper choice of which technology you use for it. We actually went through three different choices already. Uh, we used Elasticsearch initially. We are using Graphite, and our colleagues in Jet.com are using Prometheus. You get a vastly different performance with different backends. So make the right choice. Um, because each store has a different way of querying those metrics. Okay? And the second one, which is more important, pay attention to the limits of your dashboard tools. So typically, once the metrics are stored in your, in your time series DB, you want to query them in real time using some sort of uh, dashboarding tool like Grafana or Tableau or Python, like Jupyter Notebook. Those tools have big limitations. So learn about those limitations, which queries they can execute, and uh, which stores they support, and is there any limiting features like are alerts enabled or disabled for this? Because later on, if you do it, you will realize that most of the things that you actually built may not be available there. So do those choices right, and then Flink will deliver those metrics. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Oh, Ken. So in the curse of dimensionality, um, like what's the biggest sort of cardinality that you've been able to handle with metrics? Like how many sort of distinct values work reasonably well with this metrics approach? Um, so it's not just the number of values for each dimension, it's the number of dimensions as well, because that's the exponential scaling, right? So uh, in process, the number of dimensions is very small. It's usually like two or three. The domain of the values for each dimension can be fairly large, actually, because the only limitation for this one is the amount of memory. Um, and th each Flink subtask and each Flink subtask operator only sees a partition of, the, uh, of that dimension that actually has flown through this one. But you're already partitioning this data in Flink, so I hope that you're doing a good job already. So that partition should be kind of proportional to the real data partition. So you have a new partition of metrics that is tied up to the, to the size of your primary data partition. So you can actually handle pretty large domains. For example, we, those price change descriptions, there might be a pretty, pretty large number of them. And we have source IDs like thousands or tens of thousands. Tens of thousands, yeah. But if you want to go beyond that, like item level, which is millions and hundreds of millions, and you want to go beyond like five dimensions, definitely you need to do it as a side output. And uh, it basically means that you have a, a downstream stage in Flink that explicitly handles just metrics data. All right? And your, uh, your backend need to be able to handle it, or you need to pre-aggregate this and uh, reduce the dimensions. So do you have multiple reference architectures to support, uh, I, I guess, your, just your business intelligence? Um, if I understand this correctly, it basically means that different users may have different tools, how, oh. how they want to consume well, the metrics. No, um, so some of these require a lot more memory than just standard Flink core implementations. So I, I'm trying to figure out if you have special implementations for just the BI. No, we don't actually. But if you, if you do this with a side output, you can configure the downstream stage independently. So you can define your parallelism for it, and you can actually, you can have those big machines that are running those operators. So it's up to you. Um, early on, you mentioned quasi real time. Can you just give a little better definition around sure. what exactly that is? So that's typically in, uh, in machine learning applications where you need to serve machine learning in real time, but train it in quasi real time. So in fact, if you do it via Fling, you typically have a state which represents the model, the trained model with parameters. And uh, um, the Fling operator serves this model in real time. 
but the state is updated in quasi real time and there's a separate pipeline that delivers to the state, updates the state. That's what I mean by quasi real time. And it's up to you how often you want to retrain. I, I saw like at least three, three talks that are mentioning this architecture. This is pretty much a standard way of how you can sort of machine learning and streaming environments like Flink. All right, that's it. Thank you very much, Andrew.